good morning and welcome. Um, my name is Esther Shears. I'm a PhD candidate in the Energy and Resources Group. Today, I will be presenting a paper that was published in PNAS this past fall um, that I authored alongside Berkeley Haas professors Abhishek Nagaraj and Matthias Devon. Uh, the title of our paper, which is also our main conclusion, is Improving Data Access Democratizes and Diversifies Science. So I expect that most folks attending this conference already agree with us on the point that data is vital and necessary for all scientific inquiry. In a wide variety of fields, key data sets are playing a central role in the advancement of science uh, from health, genomics, climate change, ecology, economics, weather, and many more. Um, data is exponentially increasing in its amount, and it's also increasingly important for all of our research. But oftentimes, access to the uh, most important or newest data sets are restricted. Uh, institutions and governments, or even academic labs, are the gatekeepers that determine the terms of data access, data use, and data sharing. So in this project, we broadly ask, uh, what is the effect of data access restrictions on shaping the rate and direction of scientific progress? How do data access restrictions affect the quantity and quality of science? Um, how do they affect who participates in science? And how do they affect what kinds of topics are studied? So we locate our study on Landsat. Uh, Landsat is a NASA USGS um, operated remote sensing program that was first launched in 1972. Uh, this shows a New York Times article announcing the successful launch of the first Landsat satellite. And I'll quote here, um, a new era of Earth exploration began yesterday with the successful lofting of an unmanned Earth orbiting satellite that will continuously scan the surface of the Earth, radioing back many kinds of information on global environment and natural resources. So for those not as familiar with Landsat, um, it's a series of satellites. Um, I believe uh, Landsat's satellites seven and eight are still active and orbiting. Um, these satellites capture images of the Earth and they store these images in a central archive. This is the longest record of its kind of the planet. Um, so what can researchers use Landsat images for? Um, here are some examples of, uh, these are side-by-side -side scenes of a specific block or a specific kind of area of the Earth um, over a period of time. So, Researchers um, can use these images to study deforestation, like in the Amazon rainforest, uh, glacier melt, urbanization, um, this is New Delhi here, and also like flooding events or different types of natural disaster events. Um, and there's obviously many more applications, those are just a few. So while the government, government um, or the program was originally run through NASA and other government agencies, um, it did undergo a period of time where it was um, some of its operations were transferred to the private sector. Uh, the Land Remote Sensing Commercialization Act of 1984 resulted in the transfer of Landsat to a commercial entity, um, EOSAT. Um, and this effect was um, resulted in an increase in prices per image. By 1991, um, each scene, so each kind of block of the earth, uh, could cost as much as $4,400. If someone were to ask for images that would cover the entire United States, this could cost you as much as $2 million. Um, most people might not necessarily want such a wide um, or big image of the earth in terms of area covered, but most researchers want more than one scene um, since the most common application of Landsat data is in change detection. Um, so scientists were also not allowed to share these images with any collaborators as well. Uh, but this period of private provision was repealed in the early 90s uh, with the Land Remote Sensing Policy Act of 1992, which went into effect in 1995. So Landsat was transferred back to NASA and USGS, and as a result, data was made available at a cost of fulfilling user requests, and free sharing for non-commercial and scientific use was permitted again. So our main focus and question in this research area is how did the reductions in the cost and data sharing restrictions um, after the Land Remote Sensing Policy Act that went into effect in 1995, how did this reduction affect the scientific efforts that build on Landsat data? 
So to dig into this question, we rely on two main data sources. First, um, data on academic publications. So we built a data set from Scopus of about 24,000 publications by 34,000 authors from 1974 through 2005 that referred to Landsat in either their title or their abstract. So for each publication, we geoparsed the, the title and abstract text to match it to a specific Landsat block on Earth. Um, we also did this geoparsing process for the authors, institutions as well. So for each publication, we have data on the study location. So what these images um, or what the paper was studying um, and also the author's locations as well. So this is one example of a paper that's included in the data set. Um, we would run the title, the author affiliations, any keywords and the abstract through this machine learning algorithm that would pull out any type of place. Um, and then it would give us the lat long and then we would take that data and match it to the respective Landsat block. Um, okay, and then our second data set is obviously the Landsat image data, the metadata. Um, for the 12,577 blocks that cover Earth land masses, we have Landsat image data. So for each block over our study period that goes up until 2005, we have record of all the images taken by a Landsat satellite. So which satellite, what date the image was taken, um, the image quality, so how much cloud cover was there, and a few other measures as well. So this shows um, a fairly old record of one of the earlier Landsat satellites um, back in the mid 1970s. Um, it shows where the images were taken. So you can actually see how in the earlier days of Landsat, um, it wasn't taking pictures um, continuously. It was, it was taking pictures of just certain parts of the world. So there was uh, this variation in coverage um, in terms of how many images would be available for the particular area. So from 1974 through 1985, when Landsat costs started to increase as a result of the commercialization um, in 19, 1985, um, we compiled image counts of all the blocks in our study. The median image count is 18. So for every block, um, the median amount of images taken would be 18. So this map shows that by 1985, which blocks had above median coverage, and that's the blue, um, and which had relatively lower Landsat image coverage, and that's the yellow. Um, we're going to use this coverage kind of variation and this distinction to set up our control and treatment groups for when we study what happens in 1995 when the costs of Landsat data access start to decline. So I'll revisit this in a second. So the theory, uh, the economic theory behind the different outcomes of what could happen when cost reductions and access restrictions um, go down um, is kind of explained out here. Um, as costs decline, we could see either an increase or a decrease in the total publications um, that use Landsat. Um, we also could see costs, as costs decline, we could also see either an increase or a decrease in high quality research. Um, so on one hand, lower access costs mean there's more competition of researchers, researchers will study different unexplored areas, um, but on the other hand, with more access, the, the marginal research could be lower quality. So once the data is freely shareable and everyone can access it, will these high quality researchers leave and use other data sources? So our research design starts with some simple descriptive statistics, just looking at what is happening over time and across different types of authors and regions. Um, but then we also employ a difference in differences regression. Um, we're comparing these high coverage and low coverage blocks in terms of their response to reduction in costs post-1994 uh, with year and block fix effects. So potential research on blocks with a greater amount of data should have been more affected by the privatization and then the subsequent opening up as compared with blocks that had fewer high quality images. So in order for us to, to verify this or to validate this comparison or use this comparison, um, we have to make sure that the above median Landsat coverage areas, they're not 
necessarily areas that are more likely to be studied. Um, they're just areas that would have been more affected by um, cost, re cost restrictions. Um, so our research addresses, our research design addresses this um, directly. So we control um, for any selection in terms of which blocks get better coverage. Um, we control for the average number of publications in any given block. So this is the block fix effects that we use in the regression to help um, kind of control for this and examine whether treatment blocks have a greater increase in publications as compared to the control blocks um, following the transition to the open era. So if treatment blocks increase their publications more than the control blocks, we can conclude that improved data access has a causal effect on scientific output. But I'm gonna go ahead and move into the descriptive kind of results right now. Um, so this long dash line kind of like is going up uh, represents the trend of all earth and environmental science publications, while the bars are the Landsat publications in our data set. And we can see that post 1995, as data access restrictions are lifted, we see this steady increase in Landsat um, publications. But what's more intriguing with this figure is actually what's happening during this commercialization period um, between 1985 and 1994, um, where the earth science publications are continuing to rise, but the Landsat publications really taper off. Um, we see this trend also in these, how we defined higher quality researchers or high quality publications. So this is what happens to um, when we restrict that data set to just Landsat papers that have above 100 citations. Um, and these are any publications that appear in these top tier journals. So the trend from that first graph is consistent in only the high quality uh, research as well. So while those were just some of the descriptive findings, um, here is the, the main result of our diff and diff baseline specification. Um, our estimates from this model with block and year fix effects suggest that the number of published research articles um, at the block year increased by a factor of three um, as a result of improving access. Likewise, the number of highly cited publications increased by a factor of six, um, while the probability of any publication at the block year increased by about 50%. So these are estimates. Um, they indicate the relative increase in publications between the treatment and control groups. So this is not about the total global increase as indicated in the main figure. So since the US was such a big part of the treatment group, we, we run another version of this estimation where we exclude all US observations and we find the re result to be fairly robust as well. Um, we see here that it is unlikely that results from our main research design are driven by unobserved differences in treatment and control blocks or by, um, or by overrepresentation of the United States. Uh, we actually run many more uh, specifications of this regression for various types of robustness checks, um, but for the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving forward with our other results. So beyond just investigating the quantity and quality of Landsat related research, we go further into exploring who is working with Landsat data and what topics are explored with the data. We expect that researchers from less resourced, less well-resourced institutions and locations um, will begin using Landsat data as access becomes easier. Um, and further, we expect a wider range of topics that will be studied using Landsat. So new scientists that start to use Landsat data are going to be studying local topics. Um, so starting with the author location, so this is who is using the Landsat data. Um, this map shows the locations of authors who use Landsat data in a scientific publication. Um, a yellow dot here indicates locations with at least one researcher publishing a paper from the period of 1985 through 1995. So this is when data access was very costly um, and there were strict um, sharing restrictions. But then if you look, the green dots now indicate the locations with researchers who started publishing Landsat research only after data access restrictions were reduced. So these green dots represent these new author locations. Um, so this is potentially enabled by the reduced cost of access to Landsat data after 1995. So while many authors in the United States and Western Europe were already leveraging Landsat data, when access restrictions were really high, 
Many researchers from regions such as South America, Africa, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East and China started exploiting Landsat information only when access restrictions were reduced. So this graph shows the total number of Landsat publications separated by institutional rank. Um, so there were obviously a couple of gaps in our data, but for author affiliations that we could match to any type of institutional ranking we did. Um, so this separates the top 50 from the top 50 to top 200 institutions based off of the QS World University rankings. Um, but then we also plot the number of publications separated by the author's country income category. So any publications with authors from different country incomes, we decided to sort them based on their minimum country income group, um, since there was a period of time where you couldn't really share this data. So overall, the data suggests that lowering costs of access was particularly helpful for authors in lower ranked institutions and in non high income institutions or countries. Sorry. So we now turn to examining the question of whether this change also resulted in increased diversity in scientific focus. Specifically, um, we explore whether improved data access facilitated research on previously unexplored study locations and topics as indicated by words used in the abstracts. So I'm gonna start with the study locations. Um, this is a map that demonstrates any type of study location that was identified in the paper. Um, and these are the study locations that have already been covered in Landsat research by 1995. Um, and then the green dots will show new areas that have that occur in Landsat research after 1995. Um, so this map shows that after data access improved, there were certainly more new study locations that emerged mainly in the middle and low income regions of the world. So this plot further kind of validates this reduction in study location inequality. Um, this is the cumulative number of unique study locations in, in um, so the US and high income countries are in the black and the gray versus the rest of the world is that light blue. Um, so improving data access is really associated with an increase in the study locations. Um, so at this point, we have shown that improved data access led to this entry of new scientists, as well as to focus on new study locations, but it's not clear yet um, that these aren't necessarily related. Um, maybe the new scientists are studying areas that have already been studied before. Um, so we're going to we conduct a few additional analyses to kind of look into this further. So we first decide to split our sample of publications in this open date open data era. So this is post 1995. So we look at the publications that occurred during that time. And we split that into those that have at least one author who had previously used Landsat data during this commercial era. So those are gonna be our incumbents. And then we're gonna split those with any type of publications, any author public of publications that had never previously used the data. So these are the newcomers. Um, so then we calculate whether new study locations were introduced mostly by newcomers or incumbents to using this Landsat data. And we find that newcomer publications introduced roughly 3,900 new study locations, while incumbents introduce roughly 1,900 study locations. This difference is partially driven by publication volume increasing over time. But even if you adjust for this difference, the newcomer publications are still 15% more likely to introduce a new study location. So if scientists are more likely to be from different parts of the world and they have a variety of different research interests, it's possible that they use Landsat data um, to examine previously unexplored topics. For example, um, a Chinese researcher using Landsat is not only more likely to study a region in China, he or she are also more likely to focus on questions of relevance to a local context. Um, one example in our publications data was a paper um, of a Chinese researcher studying an infectious disease spread from a local freshwater snail. Um, so that's, that's one paper that we found. Um, and Western scientists in the past might have ignored this topic. So this graph plots the introduction of novel words in the um, abstracts that we find um, by calendar year. So any new words that we're seeing. 
So while the introduction of novel words was kind of decreasing when the data sharing restrictions were in place, um, there's a large increase in the number of unique words in literature after 1995. So this trend is suggestive of an expansion in the scientific focus towards a more diverse set of topics and fields. And the last thing I'm going to share um, before wrapping up is while data do suggest that newcomers introduce more novel words than incumbent scientists, it's not obvious that these words represent meaningful new research topics. So to address this concern, we measure the semantic relationships between newly introduced words and examine the internal consistency of these words. So we use word embedding models to examine the vectors of words introduced by newcomers and incumbents. So for each word, we identified five words closest in this embedding space and compute the average distance between them. So for example, if we observe the term tree, our method would classify it as being more related to forest than another word like glacier. So the computed average distance is really a measure of how related the newly introduced word is to other um, newly introduced words. So we log transform this measure to produce a relatedness index uh, where the larger, a larger number on this relatedness index represents a word that is more internally consistent and more likely to be a part of a broader topical discussion. So we plot this distribution of these indexes separately for new words introduced by newcomers and incumbents. And this graph clearly shows that the distribution of words introduced by newcomers is shifted to the right. Therefore, newcomers not only introduce more new words to the literature, but these words are more internally consistent, which suggests that they may capture a new topic or a new set of topics. So taken all together, uh, the results presented um, are fairly clear. Not only did the opening of Landsat data lead to the entry of a more diverse author base, but the newcomers also diversified the scientific discourse itself. So when data access barriers are relaxed, um, it is much more likely to be exploited by scientists, leading to a greater quantity and quality of scientific output. Further ease of data access democratizes science by allowing authors with fewer financial resources to participate in the scientific process. This process of democratization also increases the diversity of scientific research itself. Ultimately, we recommend that any policies to restrict access to important data sources should consider the costs of such measures on the quantity, quality, and the diversity of science before they are implemented. So in the spirit of practicing what we preach, um, here is a link to our project page. The Landsat data that we used in our research is freely accessible, while the Scopus data are only accessible with a subscription. Um, we have created this OSF repository that includes links to the freely accessible data um, and query statements to extract the Scopus data. And this also includes all of our code um, to generate the results. So thank you so much for your time and attention. I look forward to any feedback and questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Esther. Um, we've got about five or five or six minutes um, left for anyone who wants to ask any questions or or offer feedback. So um, you can either put them into the chat or you can just unmute yourself and, and speak up. Let's see. Could let's I see. ask a question about what sources of data are now used? I mean, is Landsat now a bit out of date compared with Google Earth and Microsoft AI for Earth, or is it still absolutely central to all the thinking in climate science? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I haven't looked at this in the past like two years or so, but when we looked at, um, when we expand our kind of look into researcher research publications that use Landsat data, we still see fairly high numbers that go into like 2018. So obviously scientists are still using Landsat data, whether that is whether they've used it before, so they're gonna to continue to rely on those images. Um, so I certainly don't think it's out of date. Obviously there are much more good competitors and supplements to it, um, but it's still actively used in research. All 
Hey, Mateo, do you have a, you're unmuted. Would you like to ask a question? I'm sorry, I think uh, it was by mistake, sorry. Oh, <laughs> no problem. Well, maybe a second question. Going back to your very early slide where you showed shared, uh, showed that basically data has exponentially increased in the last few years. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I think some people say that, you know, maybe 95% of data is, is new in the last six or seven years. I'm still trying to understand what is it that the new data might now enable us to understand better about all climate issues than the sort of historical data. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's a fair question to to ask you, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to help prepare a lot of connections with COP26 in Glasgow in November, and I'm wondering what is the most exciting story from the group of people around you that we should be trying to include? Yeah. Um... That's a great question. I mean, obviously, um, we can see here, it's not just in um, like health spaces, but also even in climate spaces, there's a lot of data that has been generated just in the past decade. Um, and our study was really looking at much more like historical data. I think there's always been a role in climate sciences for looking like at long periods of time. Um, that's sometimes like a better way of looking at like a historical progression or to really put in perspective the rate of change that we might be seeing in all this new data. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's probably the best way I can think about it now. I mean, obviously, when we think about the progression of like glaciers or these other big land changes over time, those tend to have a much more historical perspective. Um, although climate scientists now have such a sophisticated models um, and data sources that they can certainly be making these types of um, conclusions on very like small scales, but I do still think there's a role in, in putting it into a broader historical perspective. We've got about one minute left for questions if anyone has any, any quick ones. Um, Otherwise, we can move on to the next one. And uh, if if you think of one later, or if you want to keep the conversation going at a different time, um, the Slack channel is open, or you can continue talking in the chat. All right, why don't we go on to the next one? Thank you so much, Esther.